Welcome to Tech Alpharetta's podcast series, Driving Innovation, where we're going to be exploring the people and the companies that are driving innovation in the city of Alpharetta. I'm Karen Cashin, CEO of Tech Alpharetta, and we're going to be exploring startup success stories, under the radar exits, serial entrepreneurs, and transformative leaders in this series. This series is sponsored by V-Link Solutions, the Video Marketing Authority. They are also a Tech Alpharetta graduate startup success story, and the founder, Scott Wilford, CEO of V-Link Solutions, is here with me this morning. Scott, welcome. Let's talk a little bit about V-Link and then explore some of your other entrepreneurial pursuits. V-Link Solutions, tell me about the business. What do you do? So we are, uh, traditionally we've been a video marketing company. So uh, the, the very short story is that I realized there was a market for marketing agencies that really focused with video being the medium. So we help people drive and measure engagement through the use of online video. So we're both a technology company and a video marketing agency. Uh, but with the new world order caused by the pandemic, we've actually began and developed a virtual events platform. So we're also helping people live stream events and hosting virtual events using high production value, but also the technology that we've built in the last few months. And how is it going? Have you seen a demand for that new functionality that you built in the last few months? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We have actually seen... Um, a, a huge spike in use uh, of virtual events. And when we looked at the marketplace, there was, you know, basically the, the webinar, and then there were these very expensive and sometimes not even that functional uh, virtual event software and uh, software companies. And so what we said is like, how can we give a, um, the market a, a product that falls in between a $200 webinar and a $25,000 and up dollar software solution that also included our production skills. So we uh, started development in early March of 2020 and actually launched the product May, excuse me, April the 9th. Wow, uh, that's a less, tight development yeah, timeline. In less than 30 days, we did our first event. It had limited functionality, but now we've done things like World Trade Day, and we're getting ready to do a huge event tomorrow night. And, and so we've had uh, thousands of people come through our virtual venue, and, uh, and the demand is growing. We're probably doing five to six demos a week right now. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. So V-Link Solutions, start up at our center. How did you find out about Tech Alpharetta's Innovation Center? So for, for V-Link, we had been, uh, I, I've been in the startup community around Atlanta for a long time. And we started in Marietta, which is where we live, uh, or where I live. And, and then when I started looking at different hubs of where industry was happening, Alpharetta was a logical, logical choice. And, uh, and so when we began to look at real estate up here, we knew it was going to take a little bit longer because in, you know, three years ago, the real estate market here was extremely um, crowded and, and, and they were still doing a lot of construction. And so we just needed a place that we could grow our contacts within Alpharetta and also continue to innovate the technology that we're building. And so Tech Alpharetta was a logical choice. And we joined here right away. And then when we graduated, which was about nine months later, uh, we you know, continued to support the organization. Terrific. And uh, did you find it helpful being part of an incubator? So because I've got a serial entrepreneurial background, uh, you know, we, we found it helpful for all the connections. Uh, so being able to connect with other early stage companies as well as a lot of the sponsors within the Tech Alpharetta community, that really made a difference. And, you know, knowing the reputation that Tech Alpharetta has and being part of its branding committee and part of its uh, marketing strategy uh, as a marketing person, uh, you know, it's just been a great ride. It's, it's fun. We've met a lot of people. We've landed some good relationships and contacts and have done a, a fair amount of business with other people that are part of, part of the community. So it's been a very, very beneficial. And I, and I recommend it especially for entrepreneurs that are out there because if you're an entrepreneur and you need to make these connections and you don't have that network, this is a great way to connect with and learn more about what's going on in the Alpharetta community. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a really big part of what we try to accomplish here at our incubator, the Tech Alpharetta Innovation Center. And once you graduated from the center, you opened up a studio right here in Alpharetta. 
Yeah, we, we have a studio uh, on Royal Drive, which is right off the of North Point Parkway. So it's a mile and a half from here, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe two miles. I'm not right. exactly sure. Uh, and uh, we have a very large studio there. It's got a green screen psych wall, uh, green room. I mean, it's a great uh, venue for, for what we do. Uh, and it was a really learning opportunity for us because our first studio, we, when we built it, we didn't know how all the functionality would be. And then we were able to, to correct some of the mistakes we made when we opened up the second location. Well, I, I know personally it's a fantastic space because back when we were able to hold in-person events, we held a, a really fun Tech Alpharetta mixer at that studio. I hope it's we're back there space. soon. I yes. hope we're back there soon. Yes, you and me both. So let's talk now a little bit about your serial entrepreneurial pursuits other than V-Link Solutions. Georgia Tech graduate, right? Mm -hmm. um, aerospace engineering, was that? That's correct. Did I see that was your, your major? Okay. Uh, what led you to aerospace engineering? I have to ask that question. It's an unusual major. So it, it's interesting. Uh, I had a very high aptitude for mathematics, and so STEM was a logical choice for me to go into some form of engineering. And when I got to Georgia Tech, they made you choose an engineering. You couldn't go undecided engineering. So I picked the first one in the alphabet. And so I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, I like to say it may not take a rocket scientist, but it doesn't hurt to have one. Uh, I've never used the degree other than the logical thinking, uh, problem solving that I, that I gained from going to Georgia Tech. And, uh, and while I was in school there, I actually moved into technology pretty quickly. So I got my first technology job while I was in school there as a sophomore selling personal computers in the early 80s. And, uh, and then that got me started on a love of technology, a love of software, a love of personal computers. And, and of course, I've lived through all of the different uh, iterations that we've seen over the past 35 years. So was that your first company? So I, uh, I was in sales and, uh, and did really, really well. And uh, at, after having two different uh, sales jobs, learning technology and telecommunications, I started my first business when I was 27. It was a uh, voice and data telecommunications consultancy. So we helped large corporations manage their voice and their data uh, technology companies, uh, large banks that you would be familiar with, hospitals, universities, all across the nation. Uh, so uh, my business partner was my father, uh, and uh, I actually bought him out in 91 and continued to grow the company. But what happened was is that as a consultancy, we learned that you're selling a professional service an hour at a time. And so you're limited to the number of hours that you have based on the number of people that you have. So we started dabbling in some software to help us do our job. And the plan was to license that software to telecommunications departments and uh, within large corporations. And, uh, and then I saw this cool thing called the internet and uh, thought that's gonna be a game changer. And this was in 94. And so I came back, met with another friend of mine from Georgia Tech and learned more about what the internet was going to become and got excited about it and invested into a early stage company down at ATDC at Georgia Tech in 95. Went with full time with the company in 96 took it from two engineers and me to four and a half million users in three years. Oh, that's phenomenal. So age 27, when you started your first company, I just have to ask, since that's still fairly young, had you already developed the tools and experience that you needed to run a company or was it a learning on your feet endeavor? Definitely a learning on your feet endeavor. <laughs> uh, you know, as an entrepreneur who's, who's done it a few times and coached other companies, I will say that it all starts with sales. So one of my dear friends and, and one of your dear friends, Tom Berger, says revenue is the wonder drug. Right. And so if, if you are an early stage company, start selling right away. Uh, land clients, that's going to be the cheapest capital that you ever get is revenue. And so because I could sell... I started selling services sometimes before we could deliver them. <laughs> uh, and that's continued to today. Uh, we, we've successfully implemented the things that we sold, but uh, you know, you gotta sell off a slide sometimes. That's right, a little visionary optimism is not such a bad thing. Yep. Definitely not. And was it 
a risk at that time. You were still in your 20s, so probably had less to lose, but family, other considerations to take into account when you're starting a, a company. So it's, it's kind of ironic. Things in my life have always come in threes. Uh, I started my new business within four months, five months of that. My wife found out she was pregnant with our first child, and about four months into that, she was laid off. Uh. So yes, the risk was very high. Yeah, no pressure uh, there. And, uh, and, and I think that that's one of the things that all entrepreneurs got to remember is you cannot do it without a certain amount of risk. And you've got to decide what runway you have to have in order to survive. Absolutely. At the time I started uh, that particular, you know, we were that particular entity, uh, we were, you know, double income, no kids. But by the time I actually got on our feet and running, you know, I was this, you know, it, I was the sole income provider of our household, and so there was a tremendous amount of risk. Future endeavors carry different levels of risk, but you also put more money on the table. That's right. So you know, each each time I've helped start a new company or been part of an early stage endeavor. Uh, it seems like I up the ante on what I put in and the amount of risk I carry, but yeah. I'm also in a different position today than I was, you know, in my 30s and 40s. Sure. And would you say that an appetite for risk, or at least a tolerance for risk, is a trait common to entrepreneurs? Yeah, it's gambling. I mean, it's flat out gambling. You are risking. Uh, with, even with this most uh, recent thing that we did, I invested a tremendous amount of money and resources to develop a virtual events platform to try to keep the company afloat. I mean, when the pandemic hit, we had a 70% drop in potential revenue for the second quarter. Uh, I'm happy to say that we not only got most of that back, we actually had one of the best second quarters the company's ever had because of that innovation and that risk. So I gambled a lot. Yes but it paid off pretty quickly, and that's usually not the case. Um, I had a, a company that I helped start with a friend of mine in 2000 after I exited the software business that I mentioned that was an ATDC company. And uh, we put you know, several hundred thousands, actually seven digits worth of our own money on the table and didn't get an income for over three years. So the risk was pretty high. That's tremendous risk. And it took right. another f three years after that to exit. So it's a... It's, it's a gambler's game, and you can't be risk adverse at all. No, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. Are there other traits or characteristics that, that you would say most entrepreneurs have in common based on your own experience as a serial entrepreneur? I think the successful entrepreneurs are good leaders. I think they are people that understand how to bring a team together. Some of us, myself, uh, didn't start out that way. I mean, I always knew how to take charge, but I wasn't always a good leader. Right. And there's a difference. And so I think you need to focus. If I was starting, I wish I would have focused more on my leadership skills and really gotten mentors early on. So uh, the most successful entrepreneurs are good leaders and they get mentors, as I mentioned that. And I've got several that are just, you know, they're guys that I, guys and gals that I can go to with problems and get, get feedback because they've been there before. And then the, the last thing that we talked earlier is just you can't be risk adverse because it's going to be risk. And you need to have your family on board with that risk because oh, the, 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 the work-life balance is, is important. Yeah, yeah. And so since you had created that company when you were 27, bought your father out, turned it into tremendous success, and sold it, I think you said? I sold it to my partners. Yes. I actually left the company three years before I sold it to them. Okay. Uh, okay. But still I, a I, successful exit. Yeah. yeah we had, we, so I, in 96, I left the company to go run the, the software, help run the software company. And then in 2000, there was an adjustment in the internet uh, market called the dot bomb. Yes, uh, remember I was it able, well. Yeah, I was able to exit, but didn't do as well as we could. We had a valuation that tanked. Oh. It, 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 it went from uh, a strong uh, eight-digit uh, number down to a small seven-digit number overnight. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, that hurts. Uh, and so we... Um, Anyway, that's a painful story. Yes. But 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 then I started another company, and and that one again that we reinvested, and and it's just a, it's a fun journey. I like to say I kind of, I mean, I've been part of a founder of at least eight different entities. Some of them have been exits. Some of them have been roll ups. 
but you, each time you learn more, you get another t-shirt, you go to the concert and you, you experience it and you right. get a t-shirt and the next time you know what to expect and you, you have pitfalls every time. Yeah. It's going to yeah. happen. You're always going to have pitfalls there. and failures and have to pull yourself back up, but you learn from it, like you said. So, um, what spurs you on to start a new company? I understand sometimes it's an exit, but is it an idea? Um, is it a desire for a new challenge? What, what makes you tick as a serial entrepreneur and move on to your next company? So I think most entrepreneurs, including myself, are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at a market, and the, the smart ones are looking at a market and say, where's there's a gap? Right. Where is there a need for what they're doing? Uh, and so I love solving those problems and helping people be successful. Uh, one of the mantras that I've had since my early, early days, uh, Zig Ziglar said, so that's dating me a little bit, uh, Zig Ziglar said, you can judge your own success by those you've helped become successful. So I've always been a pay it forward thought, you know, thinking how can I help my fellow person. Uh, ideation kind of ideas uh, in, in business. And so when I started each of the entities, we saw a problem that we thought we could solve either with technology or services or both or a combination of both. Um, and then having that flexibility to pivot was really important. So, so everything that we've ever done, we started out going one path and then we realized that the, we misguessed. Right. And so we pivoted. Um, I know that, that we've only got a few seconds, but I, I remember NetSurfer, which was the company I invested in in 95 and then joined it in 96. I actually invested into an electronic software distribution technology with the idea of going out and helping people install software over the internet. Pretty common thing today, right. but this right. was in 94, 95 when we were developing the technology. And people were just starting to become aware of the internet, really, at that time. Yeah, and, and what we found, though, is that there were some other companies that were ahead of us in the fundraising. Uh, ironically, we had been providing a software solution to one of the fastest growing startups that ever happened in Atlanta, which was MindSpring, and we had provided them software. Uh, Jeff, my partner, had written some software for Charles Brewer, and, and that software solved an onboarding problem for ISPs. And so we met with Charles and Charles says, guys, y'all have a product. Table that software distribution stuff. Embed that into this product that you built for me and go sell it to other ISPs. And that's what we did. So we had to make a very big pivot. We did it early on and that's what spurred the growth. So sometimes you think you're probably solving a problem, but then you gotta be willing to realize that's not really the problem I can solve. I need to pivot. Right. Right, have to be open-minded and flexible. I think yep. that, that type of nimbleness and agility is another serial entrepreneur trait. Yep. Well, Scott, thank you so much for joining us here today. Serial entrepreneur and Tech Alpharetta startup success story. Appreciate all your support, and thanks again. Well, we're glad we're here. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.